Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey, and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode, NDC and Kerrygold milk quality winner Richard Starrett and his advisor Tommy Doherty join us to give tips about how he consistently produces high quality milk from grazed grass and top genetics. And Richard began with an overview of the farm. I took over the farm in 1994 when my father took the early retirement scheme. We were milking about 70 cows at that time and now we're milking 160. It's a spring calving herd where we start calving uh, early February for 12 weeks. Um, the labour on the farm by myself, and there's a full time labour unit, uh, David Blackburn, and there'd be two relief milkers then who would do alternative wheat gains or during the week if needed. The farm size is 64 hectares. 54 hectares of this is the grazing block. 160 cows with a hair EBA and the top 1% in the country. All black and white freezing. We don't have any jerseys. Um, the farm goes from sea level to 600 feet. The EBA of the herd is 199. Um, Mug sub index 67, fertility 89. Um, fat predicted or fat 0.15, protein 0.12. Whereas 2021 calves, the EBA is 273, milk 95, fertility 132, with a protected fat 0.2 and protected protein 0.16. The grazing season on the farm starts on around the 20th of February, and the last grazing is usually on around mid November. So, Richard, um, you know, lots of figures there, um, you know, looking at cow numbers, uh, the type of system that you're running, um, you know, the labour available on the farm on a day to day basis and the genetics and the I suppose the grassland that you're dealing with. Uh, I suppose to roll back on a few things, um, you mentioned, you know, going home farming in 1994 and you were at 70 cows. So you've over doubled your cow numbers. At what stage did that growth occur on the farm? Whenever we, we became dual quota holders with Connick Gold, back um, possibly maybe 10 or 11 years ago, um, we were able to get extra quota that way and build gradually up over the years, um, up to, I would say 2017 would have been my highest uh, cow numbers, and I might have pulled back a few a few cows from that just to I thought I just had too many. And, and 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 speaking of the cows, you know, you mentioned um, you're you've you know very high gen, high genetic merit in the herd. Um, you know, when we when we look at it on an EBI basis, um, you know, was EBI always a focus for you? You know, to get to the level of where you're at now, or you know, is that something that you know you started somewhere along the way? I know it's always a focus. Uh, my father before me, he would even focused on RBA. Um, then the EBA came along now, and it's, it's something yeah, we really focused on to try and get a cow with good solids and good fertility. And you mentioned solids. What exactly are the, did the cows produce in 2020? In 2020, uh, 594 kgs of mock solids were produced per cow. Fat, 4.52. Protein, 3.92. 6,837 litres. The cell count of 134 and the TBC of it. And on that, uh, Richard, um, you know, a huge amount of milk per cow, you know, well above the co-op average and the national average. Um, you know, you're achieving a very long grazing season despite being in a more challenging location in the country. Um, you know, I suppose what sort of a, a diet do you see the cows on? on an annual basis, out of grass from the 20th of February to mid-November, uh, grass being the predominant feed. What other feedstuffs have you going in there? I would just feed um, meal, meal as needed, um, depending on the times of the year. Um, we could be feeding from three to six kilos of meal, um, depending, on, let's say, depending on how the grass quality is like, but uh, we manage grass, uh, measured every week. And we know then what we need to be to be feeding, like should it be bales or meal or, or, or grass and a few kilos of meal. 
So you're effectively feeding the the wedge, Richard. Yeah. What would you feed in the average year from a meal perspective? Um, it would be in around about 1.2 tons. Um, just going by what weather we're getting and stuff. It was uh, August would always be a fairly tricky month up in Donegal. We'd always get a lot of rain, and the grass dry matter would usually be in around about 13, 14 percent. So we'll actually start feeding maybe some bales even at that stage and uh, put the meal maybe up to five kilos. Yeah, so so effectively feeding the wedge and being flexible with the wedge and the weather conditions um, that you're experiencing. You're quite exposed, um, Richard, um, in your location. You know, you mentioned that you're at sea level up to 600 um, metres, but you're also, you know, coastal, I guess. Um, you know, what sort of rainfall would you get annually? Um, it's, I think it's around a, a 1600 or something like that, moles uh, at, at various, but it's not actually the rain, the annual rainfall. It's, you could go through August and you would get rain every day, um, maybe three or four moles, and it just, there's no drying and it just leaves the, the, gra- the ground and the grass both wet. That's where the rain adds up, like it's, it's a small amount falling all the time rather than a big, big large amount, like. To move on a little bit, Richard, um, the farm, um, your farm has come to national and international attention in the last few months when you were uh, crowned the 2020 NDC and Kerry Gold Quality Milk Award winner, um, you know, as the overall winner and the sustainability winner. You know, I guess you've mentioned your, you know, your milk solids, your fat, your protein, your yield, your cell count you know so all really really impressive figures um i guess what do you think um from your perspective you know made you a winner and uh, i suppose a step above the rest that were involved within the competition it was one of the main things that i would see would going forward now what's going to be happening over the years uh, we do five muck record we did five muck recordings there in 2020 and uh, we're using selective dry cow therapy for the past five years. Only cows with a cell count above 150,000 and cows maybe that got mastitis through the lactation will get antibiotics at drying off. Last year in 2020, 24 cows got antibiotics at dry off. This is based, or antibiotics to get us based on culture and sensitivity testing on these cows to see what antibiotics we need to use in them. I think that's that's a real uh, drive home thing going forward. Like it, people have to use less antibiotics. And looking at you know, it's a process that you've been using for the last five years. What was the starting point for you, Richard? Um, probably down and around cell count of eighty thousand, and just trying off, trying maybe twenty cows, um, something like that. And just we, over the years, we saw those twenty cows didn't do anything different than any other cows that got antibiotics. And I guess like at this stage, you know, looking at 24 cows being dried off through select uh, with antibiotics, you know, that's 15 percent of your herd roughly. I mean, you're at the other end of the scale to a lot of uh, a lot of people with the starting point. You know, they're at maybe 15 percent of the herd, you know, dipping their toe in the water. Um, can you give us some top tips that you've seen from using selective dry cow over, a, I suppose, a longer term? Uh, it was, the main thing is. Uh, you have that's a thing you can't rush on the milking parlor. Um, we would finish the milking, and those cows we're going to dry off would be standing in the yard waiting for us. Wherever we'd we'll get our tea and get everything else finished up, and we'll let on maybe sixteen cows into the milking parlor, and they'll get teeth sprayed and wiped. Then they'll get clean uh, spray cleaned in with uh, methylated spirits, and we'll always keep do the ones for selective dry cow therapy first, then we'll do the antibiotic ones last. And just cleanliness, cleanliness is the main driver of the whole thing. And, and even on cubicles, we always uh, bed the dry cow cubicles every day as well. Um, and put lime or sawdust on them. What sort of batches would you dry them off in, Richard? Uh, anything from 16 to 32, but we only put 16 onto the milking part at a time. I think it's it's just enough. I wouldn't we wouldn't try to dry off any more than thirty two in the one day. But like it's it's a thing you don't you don't rush. 
you don't be trying to go to another job very quick like and i think i think that's a good point richard because like you know there's there's no rocket science in what you're talking about it's just i suppose being prepared not rushing um you know making sure you follow the procedure correctly and you know i guess you know you're you're an example of somebody who has done it over a number of years and it's clearly working um you know when where you're at the stage where a very small proportion of your herd is um is is getting or needing to be dried off with um with an antibiotic i suppose a final question on that point richard um would you selectively call cows um, based on high cell count or you know a persistent offender um, across num- a number of milk recordings I, I would yeah there are certain cows and everybody's heard that need to be got rid of uh, because you think they're getting cleared then the next thing they're back next year again with the same problem and all they're doing is transferring it on to other cows and I guess the reality for you is with five milk recordings in the year, you have a lot of evidence um, and it's quite obvious where a cow is in that scenario. Um, I guess to move on to you, Tommy, um, I guess, you know, not to to overemphasize it, but this was a huge win for Richard. And as I understand, he is the first um, winner um, of the competition from Donegal. Um, to you as his dairy advisor, um, you know, you have a lot of experience and knowledge of Richard's farm and his practices uh, for a number of years. What are the, I guess, key practices or technologies that you see on Richard's farm that he has implemented that make him stand out, you know, maybe across um, the cohort of farmers that you're dealing with? And I mean, we can discuss milk quality, but we can also discuss the overall farm practices. Yes, Emma Louise, like it's a fantastic achievement. Uh, it's a fantastic achievement for Richard and the Pilistarad family to have won this prestigious award. Uh, Richard's very deserving of the award uh, as he runs an excellent dairy farm within the county here over many years prior to the one. Uh, he's constantly building and improving the farm. Uh, so not only is it a great award for the Starrets, it's a great thing for Donegal because up here like we're dealing with some exceptional farmers with exceptional herds uh, and achieve an excellent, you know, production from, you know, good land and also come from some marginal land also. So it's a fantastic achieve, achievement for uh, Donegal. Look at Louise, Emma Louise, uh, Richard's focus on soil fertility and grassland management and breeding over the years, like it's, it's the key to his success. It's not just one particular aspect like that, that, that won this award, there's a lot of simple things here that he's doing right. Uh, the big one is like the the the, the practices around fer- fertilization uh, and the use of NMP uh, and the production from grass. Right, he's using technologies such as less uh, and protected urea to benefit both the farm and the environment. Uh, Richard also has adapted technologies such as automatic calf feeder and the backlatch uh, on the grazing paddocks to improve the labor efficiency on the farm. Uh, and this also minimizes the poaching and damaging damage to the grazing platform uh, as his cows then can access the cubicle cubicles on bad weather. Uh, look, this is a very positive effect on milk production as cows are getting their full allocation uh, of dry matter, uh, even if the grazing conditions aren't right. So like up here, we have to take the, take the good weather when it comes and he's often making good quality bales. Uh, and Richard talked there about the weather that we get in August time. Like, if he can manage to to to, to spread his you know production on into August and September, it adds a lot uh, to his overall yearly production. So that's a big factor uh, that we'll be discussing more on the open day. Um, with regards to emphasis on sustainability, grassland management, uh, and high. Uh, standards of animal welfare like all have helped Richard uh, to be recognised for this award Emma Louise and to you Richard um, you know Tommy has outlined um, I guess what he sees from the outside looking in and he has mentioned uh, you know I guess a lot of factors that make your farm um, a sustainable farm you know, in terms of he talks about grassland, uh, you know, feed management, um, you know, a holistic 
uh, view on soil fertility and soil uh, fertility management, but also looking at, um, you know, a social sustainability in, in the form of, of labor efficiencies. Um, for you, like in your mind, what does sustainability mean for your dairy farm? Just at the end of all day, would more or less mean I want to farm in, in a way that I have something in good shape to pass on to the next generation the way I got it. Like would be managing soil fertility and I'm, I'm using the less this last five years, low emission slurry spreading, and using protected urea, protecting the waterways. I uh, would keep improving the breeding of the cows, uh, over sowing clover on the paddocks with solar panels fitted on the, one of the cubic house roofs and hedgerow management and much more there is other than that. Talk, talk about the, 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 you know, the next generation and, and, and looking at, at creating that viable and sustainable business that you can pass on. How important was it for you, Richard, you know, stepping into the farm in 1994 and I guess getting the responsibility from the older generation um, and the opportunity to go farming at that stage. Yeah, I think it was a, a nice age to be able to take over the reins and still have your parents there to advise you as well. Um, rather than trying to take over and when you're 30 or 40 and... Uh, just give you gives you more control of the thing and go whatever way you want to go and um, we used to have discussion groups and stuff. Yeah, we always knew what direction we had to go. Solar panels, um, Richard. You know, n- not something we see on every farm. How are you benefit benefiting from that? They're up, uh, put up now two and a half years ago, and I, I think it was uh, looking at it like it. I thought it was. Uh, one one situation because there, there weren't a big cost to start with, um, and their, their their lifespan is maybe twenty five years. Um, they'd be saving us around nine hundred euros of of electric a year, and they probably have themselves paid for maybe in six years. And where are you directing that energy that's being created with the solar panels? Goes into whatever is happening on, on the yard at the time. Uh, should it be cooling milk, milking the cows, uh, heating water, um, pumping water, anything to do with with whatever happens in the whole electric circuit on the yard? Like we use it all. We use all the electric like that, that it produces. And and looking then to uh, clover, Richard. You you mentioned clover. Um, is this a, a a new addition to the farm, or have you had a certain level of clover on the farm across a number of years? Uh, this is a new thing now this year. Um, I'm involved with the Chagas Signpost program, and we're trialing now over sowing clover into paddocks to see what sort of a success we're going to have uh, going forward. And at this at this point in time, say if we reflect over the last two or three years, on average, what sort of grass production are you achieving on the farm? Just over fourteen tons there in twenty twenty. And I guess is there an expectation that you might lift grass production, or is clover something that is going to lead to a reduction in nitrogen application on the farm? Um, hopefully, it'll re- lead to a reduction in nitrogen application on the farm. And have the same, be growing the same amount of grass with the clover making up the rest of the nitrogen. It's an interesting one and, and I guess it's it's a long-term project across a couple of years in order to um, establish clover. Um, and it, it's interesting to see it working in combination with good soil fertility and grass on management. You know, it, it can have huge potential. So it's, I, I guess something to um, that would be interesting to see on your farm. To you, Tommy, uh, consider you know thinking about the herd of cows. You know we lo- we we have all seen some clips of Richard uh, on his farm in recent months. But I guess from a genetics perspective, what sort of potential or a, a performance do you see Richard has achieved um, with his herd relative to an average EBI herd? And I guess a follow-on question from that at a herd that's producing 594 kilos of milk solids 
has he reached his peak or is there potential for more? Maybe just to answer your first question, uh, Emma Louise, like from that level of production, uh, it's a fantastic level of production, 594 kilos of solace in 2020. Uh, like by and large, he's up 161 kilos of, of milk solids uh, in the last seven years. So like this is a herd of cows that sort of peaked out in 2017. Uh, he reduced the cows then in 2018 by on around the 9%. Uh, he still sold, uh, by and large, the same volume of milk. Uh, so that, if you flick the mine back, that was basically in the drought from Donegal. We didn't get as affected as, as bad as did down south. But it was a real eye opener for farmers. Uh, that sometimes, the, 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 like, it's not all about cows. It's a matter of focusing on your good cows, offload your passenger cows. Uh, and Richard did mention it there, like the use of milk recording. And like as regards a technology and, 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 a, and a practice that farmers can adopt and use, like my one point of advice all the time is keep milk recording at least four to five milk recordings in the year and select them cows that are underperforming and pulling down your good cows. As regards where can the herd go? Uh, look, the herd, uh, as regards, as regards e e EBA, we're sitting with a herd here in the top 1%. The breeding is predominantly focused on, on, on milk subindex and fertility subindex. Within uh, the groups here and Richard's groups, uh, specifically in Donegal, they're sitting down and they're tearing their hair to cows apart. And what I mean by that is they're matching cows with high milk subindex to low, sorry, high milk subindex bulls to low milk subindex cows. Uh, they're trying to push on with their PDs and that for fat and protein percentages. Uh, and they're also watching the milk kg. So they're not necessarily focusing on all volume. Uh, they, they, they're running around that 60 to 70 kilos of milk, milk within the herd. And they're trying to breed all the time for percentages and the milk kgs will follow. As regards Richard's herd, like at the end of the day, we're sitting uh, way, fi way 500 uh, and, and 90 odd kilos of solids. What I'd be telling them is that he's, He's reached his potential. We could easily pull out 650 kilos of milk solids out of these cows, but we're up in the tonnage of meal that's going into them. And I don't think that is sustainable going forward. My advice is just to sit still, uh, keep doing what he's doing, keep increasing the genetic genetics within the herd. Uh, the grass is excellent quality going in. And that 1.2, 1.3, except a ton of meal, uh, you know, that's what he's that's what he's pulling out of them so uh, from my point of view we're not pushing any more than that we'd be very very happy uh, with that level of production uh with, with the level of input but it's the key thing uh, that we discussed emma louise was the, the practices of focusing on milk recording and the efficiency of eba uh, and then focus on the generic merit improving yearly uh, to improve the farm sustainability and also there, like as we as we look throughout the county here, and it's probably the same right across Ireland, like farmers that have placed significant emphasis there as last number of years, uh, adopting EBA and improving EBA in the hair and the herds, uh, and breeding for milk subindex and fertility subindex, like by and large, these are the most profitable and most sustainable farms uh, long term. Yeah, I think you've made some good points, Tommy, and and naturally you know, um, to increase milk solids output per cow or, or milk yield, you know, there is an obvious one of increasing the the concentrate uh, supplementation. But I mean, you know, you, you also mentioned as a follow on point there, there is a question over the sustainability of of um, of that practice. But I suppose as it stands, there's a, a really strong uh, production per cow you know, probably again, like EBI, it's probably in the top 1% in the country. So, you know, the I guess the the room and the opportunity for gains in in production are quite limited relative to maybe the average herd. Just, I guess, a final point on breeding, Richard, you know, you, you were you mentioned your fertility sub index and your milk sub index. Are there any other index sub indexes within the EBI that you would focus on with your herd of cows? And our two, I see there, what we're mainly f focusing on as well is the maintenance. 
try not to put, uh, select any uh, bulls with a maintenance under 10 when we're picking them. And the health, a very important one going forward for cows with uh, less mass status and, and good feet. So again, similar to the system, it's it's a it's um I guess looking at the cow, there's a holistic approach. Um, I suppose given the emphasis on milk and fertility, that's where the the main emphasis lies. But I guess also then the the functional traits like the the weight of the cow, and also then looking to the health. So what you'd have what you're calling cows on, um, such as mastitis and and lameness. I guess Tommy, to you, um. You know, as an advisor, um, you know, you should be welcome us all, welcoming us all onto the farm, um, greeting us at the, the front gate um, for an open day at the starts. But unfortunately, um, all roads can't lead to the northwest um, on this occasion. But Richard and the start family will open the farm to us um, next week. Can you give us some information about the event? Um, I guess, when is it on and how can we tune in and what will be, um, I guess, shown on the day? As farmers, we love a day out at this time of the year. We're after a busy spring uh, and like Donegal farmers are not fear to travel. We'd normally get into the car and head to Ballyhays or Moor Park or open days along the west or so on. But unfortunately, this year we can't uh, get doing that and it's a virtual farm, uh, a virtual farm walk. Uh, it's Tuesday the 29th of June at 11 a.m. Uh, you can register uh, by www.chagas.ie and forward slash virtual farm walk. There's various different advertisements in the Farmers Journal and Chagas platform and also through the Revo Co-op and the NDC uh, website. So Click on that link, register till it, and I promise you, like, you usually get the insight into a farm here that's bred an excellent herd of cows over, over, over the last over the last 10, 15 years. And also uh, it's a farm that is doing, you know, the simple things all all right here. We're not, you know, there's nothing overly fancy going on in this farm. It's just the basics and the simple things are all done correctly. Uh, and when they should be done. So it's promising to be a very, uh, a very, a very informative uh, talk. There's some excellent speakers lined up uh, covering genetic, genetics, uh, grassland management, the environment, sustainability, uh, and outlook, etc. So look, do your best to tune in. Uh, it will be, it will be wrapped up within an hour. So eleven o'clock time, the tea that particular morning, uh, so you all can be available. To and and I think great point, Tommy. It's um, you know, I guess this award is a reflection um and a celebration of the small things being done right, um. You know, often when we think about a uh, spring calving grass based system, the fundamentals and the starting point is good soil fertility, strong grass growth, and you know a, a stocking rate to match and good genetics in combination with all of that. And, you know, I think this conversation today has reflected that. We we'll leave the final word to you, Richard. Just like they say, um, I have traveled uh, to many farms in Ireland and abroad over my years. And it's a great pity at this stage now that we can't have people on the farm um, for a walk. And uh, we're really looking forward to open day, a virtual open day. And everyone is more than welcome to register and join us on the day. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Richard Starrett and Tommy Doherty for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.